we're going to look at a couple of things to do with history. First of all, if you came to my last lecture, uh, you might remember I spoke about Hank's book here, Hank Nelson's book, where he described uh, he described that the fact he wrote that the fact that uh, two medical orderlies were executed at Vuna Popey Mission. Now Hank's a really good historian, was a really good historian, but he made a mistake, and it was a simple mistake because he followed um, he'd used the uh, the statement of a fellow who had been on Rebel, who said that the medical orderlies had been executed, where in fact they hadn't been executed and they ended up on the Montevideo and Maru. So, Which means they got executed. Well, they, they went to the bottom, yeah. But the point is, simple mistakes can be made in history. So, uh, that was Hank. I want my... And of course it's not going to work tonight. Okay. So, yeah, so mistakes can be made in history. Now, I'm going to be looking at books tonight and uh, some of the history possibly isn't as good. So I thought I'd put this book in because this is, a, this is by Gary Followill. It's actually, um, it's actually published by Big Sky Publications who published my book. And Gary's a local Northern Beaches fellow here. And I met with him and he's done quite a good job with this book. If you can get past the first chapter, which has a lot of abbreviations in it, the final chapter in it is quite revealing. So the point is, he's come up with a theory, which I think is quite good. In an education's unstable. That's fantastic. Anyway, so the point is, mistakes can be made in history. Now this is quite a good book. I bought this book a couple of years ago. It's by Roger Maynard. And uh, that's, of course, it's about Gordon Bennett. Now, reading this book, Roger wrote here, the next day realising that Singapore, its Singapore rep was in mortal peril, the cabinet cabled to say, if the worst came to worst, he should insist on having diplomatic immunities, privileges and courtesies. And Roger posed the question, were the bureaucrats at home out of their minds? as if the Japanese would take notice of, a dipl of diplomat diplomatic niceties offered by our man in Singapore. Now, Roger actually gave this a citation to the Dictionary of Biography for Vivian Bowden, who this is, this is about. And the problem is, as you can see here, uh, Bowden asked the Department for the permission to leave, and that was the uh, Department of External Affairs, which was um, Everett. Doc Evert, uh, and he was told that he should stay, otherwise we should be deprived of inde independent information and the effect on morale would, would lead, uh, would be bad. If necessary, he should seek diplomatic immunity and await for possible future exchange of officials with Japan. By February 14th, the day before the British surrender, there was no point in remaining. Now that's what it says in the Dictionary of Biography. But when I was researching Vivian Bowden, I found these cables, and these are, of course, from the Department of External Affairs, which is, which is Doc Evert. And to, to answer Bowden when he asked to be pulled out of Singapore, because he knew Singapore was going to fall, right? Bowden was an older fellow. He'd been through the First World War. He could see Singapore was going to fall, and he wanted out. So Evert said to him, we appreciate your difficulties, but we think you should stick to your post. Otherwise, well, we shall be deprived of independent information and the effect on morale would be bad. We'll communicate again within 12 hours. And this bit sort of straight out of Blackadder, I think, but we deeply value what you have done for Australia and her soldiers and we know you will continue to safeguard Australia's interests, whatever may befall. Very best wishes. <laughs> and that's... so. So Singapore fell on the 15th, and this is on the 10th. So this is five days before Singapore falls. But true to their word, what they did is they did contact him the next day. And they said, well, if the worst comes, you and your staff to insist on receiving full diplomatic immunity, privileges and courtesies. Status is given to you by the Commonwealth, accepted by the United Kingdom government. Uh, through the pr protecting powers, we shall insist on your staff, you and your staff, be included in any evacuation scheme agreed on with the Japanese government. 
We are endeavouring, endeavouring to arrange such a scheme, but the Australian officials still held in Japan while the Japanese officials remain in Australia. If necessary, show, paraphrase, repeat, paraphrase of this to the Japanese administration. So what Evert's saying to Bowden is, you can turn around to the Japanese and say, I'm a diplomat, right? I'm a diplomat and I expect to be on the first exchange. Now the trouble is, why Roger Maynard didn't pick this up and why nobody else has ever picked this up is because nothing's been written about the first exchange of internees. And we'll get to that in a minute. But this is, this is part of history. The whole point is, this is part of history, but this sort of shows how it's history... Well, no, no, it shows... Well, let's see that Everett had the problem that he was getting no information out of Bennett, right? General Bennett. Because Bennett was getting no information out of Percival. They were, they were at each other's throat going, well, you know, Percival's... Bennett being quite an ego was, I'm sure, saying to Percival, you're not doing the right thing. And Percival saying, listen, I'm the senior officer here. So they were fighting with each other and the Japanese just had this master plan. I mean, they, their planning was fantastic. But... So what happened? What, what is interesting, we can get to the next slide, this one. This is a post-war statement, right? And it's by this fellow here, um, Herring. I was on the ML Mary Rose leaving Singapore and I met with Mr Bowden because what happened was Bowden on the 14th decided he was getting out of Singapore. It didn't matter what Evett was going to say to him. He was going to leave. He found a ship, the Mary Rose, he jumped on it, he said, I'm off to freedom, right? The trouble is that the Mary, <laughs> we'll just continue here, and met Mr Bowden on the ship sharing a berth in. The ship surrendered to the Japanese on the 17th of February, so that's two days after the, the fall of Singapore, and proceeded to Muntok. On the pier, our belongings were examined. During this examination, Bowden asked Mr Morgan of the Straits Police a Japanese word for diplomatic privilege because he didn't know the Japanese. Bowden could actually speak a jitter Japanese. He'd been in Japanese, but he didn't know the word for, for diplomat, right? So, and it goes on, of course, here that the, the Japanese were going to inspect his bag. Um, a soldier reached, reached Bowden and the lady spoke to some protesting words like, don't you touch my bag, you Japanese coolie, in Japanese to the guy. Uh, the, the Japanese reached down for Bowden's bag. Mr Bowden tried to prevent him from opening it. And at the same time, again speaking in Japanese, sort of like, don't you touch my bag. I saw Bowden make an angry movement <laughs> and believe he was actually trying to push the Japanese hands aside. The Jap appeared, appeared extremely annoyed. Well, funny about that. Grabbed Bowden by the arm, marched him outside of the cinema, leaving the kit where it was. I do not remember now how the Jap was armed, but I think he picked up his rifle <laughs> and walked behind Mr Bowden. Within 10 minutes, the Jap returned carrying his rifle. He put his rifle in the corner and held a few brief words with another soldier and continued the search. But Bowden didn't come back in. What a shot. Yeah, gone, finished. So the point is, and at that point, we didn't know that. And the Japanese high command didn't know what had happened to Bowden because this is just some, this is on Muntok, you know, on Banker Island. So we were, we were demanding Bowden to be part of the exchange, but Bowden was already dead. So, uh, but what else was happening? Well, with this attorney exchange, this, this a cable appears in one of the exchange files. Now, this is a strange thing because this is the 17th of the 1st, so this is before Rabaul was invaded by the Japanese, right? Rabaul is New Britain, is a, New Britain is an island off the, the top of New Guinea. And this, this cable arrived, and it came from Buenos Aires, um, because at that stage the Spanish were a protecting power for the Japanese before they went with the Swiss, the British went with the Swiss. But this is a direct appeal to Australia, right? Not, to the British, this is a direct appeal to Australia, and they're saying, look, Japanese official in charge of evacuation asked Argentine representative Tokyo whether Australian government would name a place near its territory to disembark Australian officials and pick up Japanese officials, ship proceeding after to Africa, I presume Lorenzo Marquis, which uh, with other evacuated persons. Now, this, 
lines on the bottom, this is going to Evert again, so it's going to copy to the Minister of External Affairs. So this is before Rebel was invaded, so before Rebel fell. Now, what they've done here is that they've, if you look at these writing, these, these notes on the bottom here, they've gone and asked the Navy what they think, right? And the Navy basically came back, well, before we get to that point, one of the things that, that is in the exchange file is, in, a, in answer to that cable, why not negotiate a dilly or a bell? Right? Because at this stage, the Japanese hadn't got to rebel and they hadn't got to, to Timor. Why not start with diplomatic reps only? Now, this is just a handwritten note within the file. But the thing is, at that time, so that when that cable first arrived, Rabaul was still intact and it was still under Australian administration. Now, who would they have needed in Rabaul for the, for the diplomatic exchange to take place? They would have needed the administration, the Australian administration that was already there, right? Now, Rebel had been getting bombed since about the 2nd or 3rd of January by the Japanese because they were flying down from Truk and they were bombing Rebel. And so the funny thing is, this again, so this is sort of like where they've typed up this, where they've gone and say the exchange might, so far as it's concerned, be affected at Dili, which is still nominally, nominally uh, neutral territory, or failing that rebel. Now the thing is, they went to the Navy and said, which one should we use? Should we use, should we use uh, Dili in Timor, or should we use, use rebel? And the Navy came back and said, well, if a Japanese ship comes to Dili, we've got to show them the way through the minefield, because we've set up this great big minefield there, and if a ex Japanese exchange ship, because because Dili was Portuguese, so Portugal was still neutral, right? It, it was neutral territory, well, supposedly neutral territory, but, but they had all these minefields. So they would have had to show the exchange ship the way through the minefields. So they ruled out Dili, which left for a bell. But then this next slide is quite funny. This, this was uh, after Rabaul had fallen, right? The Japanese army decided that they were going to, uh, they were going to hand the prisoners in Rabaul, the civilians and the, the army, the military that had been caught in Rabaul, the Japanese army decided they were going to give them to the Japanese Navy to look after because they were going off to fight on New Guinea mainland, Kokoda Trail and what have you. So they pulled all the prisoners together in the, in the camp in Rabaul and Gordon Thomas has this in his book. And he says, uh, he started criticising here, something should have been done long ago. I remarked that when they mentioned the general, being level of authority, now the authority was Harold Page, who was Earl Page's brother. Earl had been acting prime minister, He'd be, he's head of the uh, uh, country party at that stage. So Harold was his brother. Now, Gordon Thomas is having a bit of a go at, at uh, Harold Page for not letting, getting the civilians out of rebel. Now, Harold answers here, as soon as I ever learned, because there was a ship in there called the Herstein, and it was a Norwegian ship that had gone to Rabaul to unload munitions and barbed wire and things like that. This is before the fall of Rabaul. They were trying to give them a bit of stuff to fight with. But the Herstein was docked in Rabaul and they were loading it with copra, right? And Harold says here, as soon as I learned the details of the vessel Herstein, when she first arrived, weeks before the invasion, I radioed Australia for permission to take her over for the purpose of evacuating civilian population. The permission was refused. Later when things got a bit warmer, in other words, they're getting bombed every day and they knew the fleet was coming down uh, with NIP air raids, I repeated the request pointing out the urgency of the case, but they wouldn't hear of it. I can assure you, Tommy, which was Gordon Thomas, I did everything possible. And he probably did. But if the Department of External Affairs was going to go ahead with the exchange and rebel, they needed these guys up there. So they're in the position, this is all happening very quickly too. I mean, we're, we're talking the first, you know, three months of the war here, or in fact, you know, first January 23rd, rebel was, was, was taken. So you're in the first month of the war. Everything was happening so fast. That I don't think the Australian government could keep up with it, to be honest with you. 
Now, this is also to do with the internee exchange. And the reason I'm doing the internee exchange is because there's so little information about the internee exchange because it was all designated secret during the war. So anything that was designated secret during the war went under the 30 year non-disclosure rule post-war. Now, this is, this is in May. So this is before the Montevideo and Maru sale. Um, and this is a telegram, the Japanese government asked for certain named Japanese non-officials to be repatriated simultaneously with, with officials. The list of names is yet to be received, yada, yada, yada. Um, so the Japanese are saying, these are the specific internees we want back from Australia, right? <laughs> and so in May, the list arrives, and this is only part of the list, but I've put this little arrow on this one here because this guy here actually was a Japanese spy. And he was up in Malaya, or he was up in um, Indonesia. I, I, he was up in Indonesia prior to the war breaking out. So <laughs> what happened was when the war broke out, we said to the Dutch, round up all the Japanese and intern them, right? And the Dutch said, well, I don't think we can do that because under the Triartite Pact, which our families are under in Holland, the Japanese are allies of the Germans, right? So what we'll do is we'll round them all up and we're going to send them down to you in Australia. So we had them all down in Australia. Now, the thing is, what did these guys have? What did these Japanese have? Well, they'd been living up there for years. So they had knowledge of the tin mines, the rubber plantations and the oil wells. They knew the local people, they knew the local dialects. They, some of them had been up there for years. They're part of the community. So who did the Japanese need back? They needed these guys. So, <laughs> to cut a long story short, um, we were negotiating from a point where we knew that there were basically the Australian staff in Japan, which, which was about 23 or something like that, or let's say 20. Um, there was all the Australians in Singapore that had been captured when Singapore fell. But we only asked for two people back. We only asked for Vivian Bowden, who was already dead, right? But we didn't know he was already dead, right? And we, we wanted a guy called David Ross. Well, we won't go into all that tonight. I've, I spoke about that in my last lecture. You can have a look at that if you, if you want. Um, but what happened was, because we were demanding these guys to be part of the exchange, Curtin kept saying, look, there's an imbalance of numbers here, right? You guys are asking, you Japanese are asking for over 800 of your people back, right? And we're only asking for two and you're telling us you can't get them, right? There's a problem here, right? And there's a problem politically here, right? So. Anyway, I, I believe, it's my theory, um, that the 200 civilians that went on this ship called the Montevideo Maru were being taken back into the area of exchange closer to Japan. So then the, the Japanese could say, okay, look, to balance the numbers, we're going to offer you 200 civilians, right? And I've just put this in here basically because I want to, at this point, introduce um, Harold Williams. Harold Stannett Williams, here he is here. This is from the history of the Directorate of Prisoner of War and Internees, right? This was written in 1951 after the war. And it says, with the exchange, because it doesn't want to go into what happened in the exchange, right? Especially the, the information, because it was all secret still in 1951. General problems arose regarding the accommodation on the vessel of these persons returned and blah, blah, blah. It was probably to, uh, it, it is not proper to deal with those in this report. In other words, we're not going to tell you, right? It should be realised that the above resume is very brief summary of the exchange story, right? So in other words, they're telling us nothing because they don't want to tell us that they've released 800, over 800 Japanese, and I'll, you'll know why in a minute. Um, and uh, basically it comes down here. In this, the directorate was very fortunate in having at its disposal Major Harold Stannett Williams, whose knowledge of Japanese psychology was a great asset. Now within the exchange file, there's this little note here, which is um, July 1942. Dr. Anastie Wins, he's Evett's secretary. Colonel McMahon here, McCahon, 
he was the head of DPWI, and here's Captain Williams. Now, Captain Williams is actually, he hadn't been promoted to major at that stage. So here he is in the exchange files. So the point is, Harold Williams knew of the exchange from word go. That's what I'm, I'm putting across here. And we just quickly go on to these. And these are cables from the exchange, but as you can see, every one of them is designated secret. All right? So the point is, being designated secret, the story couldn't come out after the war. So, again we go back to the history of the Directorate of Prisoner of War and Turnees 1951, and it starts talking about a letter drop that occurred. Now what happened here, this is the only theatre of the war this happened, the prisoners in Rabaul were allowed to write a letter home, and the letters were dropped over Port Moresby. It says Rabaul, but they got that wrong. It was the, during a bombing raid over Port Moresby, the Japanese dropped this bag of mail and it came down on a streamer and lo and behold, it was letters written by the civilians and the military men in Rabaul. Now, Harold never mentions this in any of his reports, right? But post-war, in 1946, he's, brought, he's giving an affidavit in a court here, right, against... Uh, He's giving an a, a affidavit against a general who was at that time in charge of the Prisoner of War Information Bureau in Japan. And they were trying to, trying to say that that fellow, the, 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 the officer in charge, hadn't reported anything about the sinking of the Montevideo Maru and the Australians that had been lost on the Montevideo Maru. Now, the Japanese did a very smart thing at the end of the war. What they did is within each of their departments, just before the end of the war, they swapped all the officers around, right? So that the guy that was head of DPW, uh, the Prisoner of War Information Bureau, in, in 1942 was long gone. He was, it was like musical chairs. They just kept swapping them around. Now the thing was that when Harold got there, the fellow that was in charge of the Prisoner of War Information Bureau had only been there since 1940, he'd only been there since late 1944. Right? So when Harold got there and said, your department reported nothing about the sailing on the Montevideo Maru, he could honestly say, I don't know what you're talking about, because he wasn't there. But Harold took that to be, he was being uh, defensive and deceptive and saying that they knew nothing about it, you know, couldn't be right. Well, possibly it could. But what Harold let slip in this affidavit was, he writes here, in about April 42, a Japanese aircraft dropped over Port Moresby, New Guinea, two mailbags of letters and postcards from Australian prisoners of, of war in Tunis, captured in and around Rabaul. I personally examined all these letters and postcards. So he was reading every letter out of that bag and possibly censoring them and going, well, not that one, that one's not going to the family, or what have you. Um, so that places Harold, A, with... Uh, knowledge of the exchange that took place because he's helping negotiate the exchange with his psychology of the Japanese. He's now reading all the letters that happened in, in April 42 or thereabouts, March or April 42. But I also say, I also maintain, there was two letter drops, right? Because a second bag of mail suddenly turns up. But when does it turn up? Now, there's... <laughs> What's important here, and I've, I've put it in red, is the date, August 17th, 1942. What happened on the on 17th of August, 1942? Well, I'll tell you. Tasu Kawai, who was the ambassador, Japanese ambassador to Australia just before the war, who got basically caught here when the war broke out, we let him, his staff, and the 840 requested non-official Japanese leave Victoria for Lorenzo Marquis for the exchange. So on August, 17th of August, 1942, the ship sailed out of Melbourne carrying exactly who the Japanese wanted. Huh? So what, happened, what else happened on the 17th of August? Well, surprisingly, on about the 17th of August, 1942, another bag of mail turns up in, in Port Moresby. But this time, Instead of it going through the normal channels of, oh yeah, well we'll send it down to Australia, it goes via 
General uh, Basil Morris, who at that stage was quite busy up on fighting on the Kokoda Trail, but he has enough time to go to the Minister of External Affairs, Doc Evatt, um, I'm handling this. And to be honest with you, I don't think any of that second drop of mail ever went through. Because right? the other problem was, by the 17th of August, the Montevideo Maru that was carrying the prisoners up through past Luzon had been sunk and all those people who had written letters were dead. Right? They were already gone. So, and this, and this is controversial because uh, the, the cover story or the story that was put out was that the second bag of mail that turned up on the 17th of August had been missed back in April. They hadn't found it back in April. Now you can imagine Three Mile Strip, which is today Jackson Field, which is today's Port Moresby International Airport. Could you imagine how busy that was around that time? They, they missed it, they, they couldn't find it, it just suddenly turned up, give me a break. Anyway, that was later, uh, later uh, when, a, when, another, when the Postmaster General made an inquiry, it was, the date was contradicted and they said that, well, on the 24th of May, April 4th, and three other bundles turned up in September, which is again a wrong, wrong date. So there's a bit of confusion about it, but I, I maintain there was a second drop. Okay, so what else happens on the, uh, on the 17th of August? Well, a very good researcher in Japan called uh, Harumi Samaguchi, he found this document in the uh, Japanese archives, uh, and it says here, on the 17th of August, 1942. Hmm, funny date, that one, isn't it? It just keeps popping up all the time. The President of the Information Bureau, Captain Yamazaki, conveyed by phone the following to the Treaty Third Section Officer. In early August, during a party hosted by the Japanese-based International Red Cross Committee, Representative Doc, Dr. Fritz Parafasini, Prisoner of War Information Bureau Director Murakami, informally conveyed to him uh, that while the Imperial Force was transporting to the rear Australian Prisoner of War aboard a Japanese ship, a US submarine attacked and sank it. It was a USS Sturgeon. It was up, up off Luzon and had come out of Fremantle. This confidential talk was given with the intention of having Dr. Pat, Dr. Parafasini transmitted an open cable to the general-based International Red, Com Red Cross Committee so that it would A, suppress the maneuvers of US submarines and B, act as propaganda on the inhumane act of US submarines as the sinking a ship boarded with prisoners, that's very Japanese, of war from a friendly country which would avoid the formal announcement of the details of this sinking. Which, in other words, which ship was sunk, where and when. At that time, the Navy Ministry made a broadcast on the sinking by short wave. And that's the important bit. That's the important bit. This is Mirakami. This is the man that's featured in the documents. This is in the War Memorial, as you can see. So Captain Tuji Mirakami here, commander of the prisoner war camp, sitting in the witness stand in the court. So that's at the end of the war. If you want to know about Dr. Fritz Parafasini, Here's a paper cutting from him. Now, where did I get a paper cutting about Fritz Parafasini from the Nippon Times, which is the paper in English, printed in English, Wednesday the 7th, February 1944. What happened was I was transcribing the diaries for the War Memorial. Before the War Memorial had the seven diaries of, of one of the rebel officers called Stuart Nottage. And Stuart collected everything, right? He collected cuttings and this, and within his diary, I was stunned to find here is a cutting of uh, Dr. Fitz Parafasini, and that's him there, passing away. So we couldn't question him at the end of the war about what had happened because he was already dead, which is very unfortunate, really, because I think we would have liked to have talked to Fritz. So what else happened? Well, this, these, <laughs> these documents were stunning as well. This, again, is from a court case, a post-war court case, right? Um, and what they're trying to do is this, is, this is the same court case that Harold Williams was, was involved in where they're trying to uh, charge the general that was in charge of the Prisoner War Information Bureau at the end of the war. Now, this document is in the file and as you can see, if you look at this closely, there's a few problems with this document. 
A, this date here, 9th of December 44, is out of alignment, right? It's not in the same grid. And you can see here that this one here, 11th of December 44, has been typed in later, right? So what's going on here? What, what is, what's happening here? Well, the problem is, if you read this cable, it says, all right, that the, the British government has learned that the following message has been broadcast by Domaini in the German language on the 17th of July. Right? You remember the last cable where they said that the, the, the Japanese Navy had broadcast information about the Sinki? Most of the 1,000 Australians, this is what they broadcast, most of, of 1,000 Australian civil and military prisoners perished when the Japanese transport ship, which was just taking them to safe place, was torpedoed by an American submarine in the southern waters. This news was given to Domaini, which was the, at that point the Japanese news and energy, by the Japanese naval circles. So this document links in with that previous one. Now, what's happening here is the government of, New, of the United Kingdom is inclined to think that this message refers to Australians captured in Rabaul. Well, there's a surprise. And mentioned in the legation note, to the ministry date is 22nd of April. Now, the problem is they're trying to date this at 1944, but down here they've got um, the fact have been transported by sea. We know a certain number of Australians would, as a matter of fact, have been transported by sea from Rabaul at about that time. Well, that time was 1942, not 1944. So you see what's happening here. What they've done is they've taken this cable from 1942 and they've changed the dates on it to try and make it 1944. So... Why? Why? Why did they do it? Yeah. Because they were trying to say that the officer that they were charging, right, knew of the sinking, right, in 1944. But this cable only arrived in 1942. So the officer that, that they were trying to charge had no knowledge of this. No knowledge of this. So to, to fit him up, basically, right, they changed the date on this, this document here to make it fit 44 when he was in charge because he wasn't in charge in 42 when this cable actually came through. And just to, just to go one step further, to make this fit properly, they had to produce this three times because they kept changing the date in it. Oh, 2nd of August? Oh no, it wasn't the 2nd of August, 11th of December, the 15th of January. We'll just cover all of them. This is the same document which this guy here is saying is a true and proper copy, right? And it's changed three times. So it's a true and proper copy that's changed three times. Try and work that one out. But to get the date right, they had to do it. So when you're looking at history and you find, come across things like this and you think, what's going on? Because you see, this one's dated 9th of December 1944. This one's dated 27th of June 1945. <laughs> so they're either saying, we sent multiple cables, you know, which you know, I think is probably what they're saying. We sent the same, same cable on five different occasions. I don't know. Anyway, a lot of it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. So that's the original one, 2nd of August. And this is the final one, 2nd of August, 11th of December, 15th of January. And it's the same cable. You work it out. So, Harold Williams. We get back to Harold again. At the end of the war, Harold was rushed to Japan basically to work out what had happened to the civilians from Rebel. Now, I maintain from his, this is his report, which was written after he got back from Japan. He says, Scraps of information collected at DPWI, the, the Director of Prisoner of War and Turnees, land headquarters, over a period of several years prior to the Japan surrender, pointed to the probability that about 1,000 prisoners of war, which is exactly the same number that was in the broadcast, right? <laughs> Officials and civilians had been embarked at Rabaul in June 1942 for a destination unknown. Close interrogation of recovered Australian prisoners of war passing through Middle Island confirmed this probability. So Harold rushed up to Japan. He goes to the Prisoner of War Information Bureau. He says, I forced them to give me a nominal role of who was on the ship. And that was the end of the investigation into the Montevideo Maru. Now, why would that be? 
Well, if they were involved with the exchange, might be a reason to keep it quiet, mightn't it? But who else knew of the exchange? Well, I read this book by Douglas McLaglen, who had been a, a prisoner of war in Changi, and he wrote in his book here on page 46, it has been in the newspaper that a Yank submarine had sunk a prisoner of ship, drowning almost a thousand POWs and civilians. So the Japanese were making no secret of it, they're actually publishing it in their papers. Well, who else knew of the exchange? Well, Freddie Bloom here, she, Freddie is actually a woman. She's an American with a name like Freddie. Uh, she had married a British medical officer. And in her diary, she noted April 12th, very persistent rumor that we'll be shipped to Portuguese East Africa. Lorenzo, <laughs> Lorenzo Marquis, and she even, she even names Lorenzo Marquis. So the Japanese are making no secret of it. John Morris was a, uh, a British lecturer at the University of Tokyo. And um, they wanted him to broadcast. He said, no, I'm not broadcasting. So uh, he wanted to get out an exchange. Now, the first ship that was coming along, uh, they said, you've got no chance. You're not going to get onto that, but don't worry about it. There's a second ship coming. We won't go into the second ship tonight because we haven't got time. But after the sinking of the Montevideo Maru, suddenly the second ship wasn't coming and he could get on the first ship. There was going to be room. There was going to be enough room for him on the first ship. Which is just, you know, just coincidence, isn't it? It's just coincidence. Well, who else knew of something, wrote something about the mixed change? Well, Russell Braddon did. If any of you have ever read The Naked Island, it's a great book, fantastic book. I know why he sold over a million copies, because it is a very good book. But what he talks about in here is that what happened was when Tasu Kawai went on the ship back to Japan, he took with him the ashes of the mini submariners who had been killed in Sydney Harbour. And when they got back to Japan, there was a great celebration because the Australians had done the right thing. They'd been very honourable and they'd sent back the ashes, right? So, <laughs> so here he is. He's up in Malaya. He's in a prison up in Malaya. And he's even hearing about it, right? And he says, oh, we're getting moved to Singapore because, you know, the, the, the Australians did this honourable thing of sending the ashes back to Japan. And some of the prisoners thought they might be might be taken to your guinea to be used as a bargaining weapon, a propaganda campaign. I mean, it, it all sort of starts making sense when you know what's going on. But why couldn't, we, why couldn't we talk about this at the end of the war? Well, after a month of negotiation with Curtin and... Because Curtin was negotiating with the British, the British were negotiating with the Japanese. Australia released 870 Japanese, right? 550 of whom disembarked in Singapore and Malaya and Burma to assist the Japanese army with the rubber plantations, the tin mines and the oil wells. Now, how could that come out at the end of the war? And here it is. This was broadcast from Radio Tokyo, you see. This is how they knew. Japanese merchants for Malaya, 800, 550 Japanese former merchants in Malaya and Burma who are leaving Lenzo Marquis because they'd come from Australia will be disembarked at, at Shoan, which is Singapore. So how could that come out? How could... Can you understand why the exchange has... Nothing's ever been written about the exchange of internees? <laughs> if, if you'd lost a father or brother or, or something up on the Burma Thai Railway at the same time we're releasing 871 Japanese to go and help the... Is there a problem here? <laughs> OK, well, let's move off the exchange a bit. I'm, I'm introducing this book tonight because you'll see why a little bit further on. Betrayal in High Places, James Mackay. I discovered this book in the late 1990s, it would have been, I think. It was recommended to Bert Spear and myself. We, we went and bought a, a very expensive copy from somewhere. And this book answers any problems you've got. Right? In it was Harold Starrett Stanett Williams, our friend Harold, saying to James Gowing Godwin, listen, James, we've, we've been ordered not to investigate this. We, we've been told we, we're not to investigate this. This is all hush-hush and we just got to forget about it. Now, I wondered about this. I wondered how this could possibly have been written in this book. So I actually contacted James Mackay and I, I spoke to him and I said, James, where, where is this information you've got? Where's this come from? And he said, oh, he said, James Gowing Godwin, 
after the end of the war, had brought secret documents out of Japan and had, had brought them back to New Zealand, where he lived. And he started to write a bit of a story about them, but he never finished it. He said he never finished it. And, and James actually wrote the book from James Gowan Godwin's documents. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. I said, where are the documents? I said, they're in a tea chest. I said, oh, great. Where, you know, how can I see them? Oh, he said, you can't. They're in, they're in New Zealand. They're in a garage in New Zealand. And I said, ah. Oh. He said, no, no, you, you can't, you know, we can't get at them now. And, and James McCry was quite old at this stage. Anyway, I just thought, oh, well, that's pretty weird. Anyway, it turned out, after a lot of investigation, not by me, but by others, that this book is basically, um, well, it's, it's, a fic it's a book of fiction. It's, it's, not, it's not history, it's a fiction book, right? But the problem is today, this book often, well, in some cases, gets quoted as fact. But it is actually fiction. Okay. Now, moving along tonight, we're going to look at um, the nurses on, on the Singapore nurses. Does everybody know the story of the Singapore nurses? They hopped on a ship, got as far as Banker Island, 22 of them, 21 of them, were marched into the ocean and machine gunned, basically. That's the basic story. My wife gave me, my lovely wife gave me this book for Christmas. It's called Sisters in Captivity, and it's written by Colin Burgess, and it's quite a good book. It, it follows the life of Betty Jeffrey. Now, Betty had been one of the Singapore nurses who had actually survived the war, and she wrote this book, her memoirs, White Coolies. The other book that was written as a memoir was Jesse Simmons, Wild History Past. Quite, quite good um, prime source material. They were there, they wrote about it, they were open and upfront about it. I had the privilege actually to, um, Betty, Betty Jeffrey's book is, is based on her diary, which is in the War Memorial, and I had the privilege to transcribe Betty's diary for the War Memorial because I know a little bit about, I, I researched these, when I was researching the Rabaul nurses, I actually researched these girls as well. This book is quite a good book. This is written by Catherine Kenny and it was written back in the 1980s when, when the nurses were still quite uh, au fait. And Catherine did a pretty good job on that. She was also the first, uh, first author to, um, to write about the Rabaul nurses. She, she'd found Jean McClellan and Jean had talk to her about her diary, and uh, I think she did quite a good. Colin Burgess's book was, was published last year, and as I said, he did quite a good job on that. Uh, the strength of Colin's book is that he looks at Betty's life prior to the war, and he looks at her life after the war. And he's got enough information there to make it an interesting book, and I think he's done quite a good job. Well, he's made a few minor mistakes, but we all do. We all do. So, <laughs> what is... What does Betty, when I'm reading Betty's book, what does she write about? Well, this is, this is what Colin hasn't got in his book because all the post-war writers don't understand about the exchange. But when I read it, I read something different into it because, you see, June 42 was a very important month. We were all looking forward to our repatriation trip to India via Singapore, right? Which is, which as usual, sort of an old wise tale, right? Now today, hoped, the story that we're still going to be exchanged at Lorenzo Marquis, where the, where the exchanges took place, right? South East Africa. Our boss Cato took himself off to Singapore on our behalf. Uh, we at least expect a letter or a parcel or a repatriation or something. <laughs> but they don't know what's happening. They don't know what's happening in the background. They don't know anything about the exchanges. They're in a camp in the middle of nowhere. But she's writing this because that's what the Japanese are telling them, right? So they know of the exchange. In, in White Cooley, so this is in her diary, but in White Cooley she said, after the arrival of these people, the first rumour about being Australian was started. Now I write this in October, the rumour still persists. So they knew of the exchange, but they didn't, they, they'd heard of it, but they didn't know what it was all about. Okay, so this is still Betty's diary, and she talks about the Great Chan. Now, she doesn't go into who the Great Chan was, but it was actually Annette Chan, right? And she's obviously got a husband in Singapore who knows something about the exchanges, and I won't go into all of that, but you can read it there. 
and uh, she goes off to be exchanged, but because she's British, she doesn't get on the ship, which sort of suggests to me that her husband probably got on the American ship, because there was two exchanges, there was a British exchange and an American exchange. So I'd say that her husband probably got onto the American ship, but her being British, couldn't get on the American ship or something along those lines. I don't know, I'm only speculating on that. I don't know. But Annette Chan's an interesting person. Um, she, she pops up every now and then in different, different forms, but uh, we probably haven't got time to go into her tonight. Now, I thought I'd just touch on this, confirmation bias. It's an interesting thing because I've, I've found myself suffering from it myself, right? And you can read that for a moment while I have a drink, but what it basically boils down to is you want to believe so hard when you're researching something that you, you're basically saying, I can make this evidence fit, right? So it's something to keep in mind. It's just human nature. If you're researching and you want something to go in that direction, and you, you can produce the biggest theory and the best theory that you could you think, oh, this is, this is all working, it's all, all clicking into place, but then you'll come to some great lump of concrete that falls in your path and you're sitting there and you, you, you can't get around it, you can't get over it. And you, so then you've got to change your theory. That's really what it comes down to. But if you don't change your theory, right, you can say, oh, well, we'll just forget about the block of concrete. We'll just keep going you know, straight ahead. Well, you can run into problems. Now, one of the things that, that was intriguing me in 2019, because I'd researched the Rabaul nurses very deeply and got to know some of them and all the rest of it, this book came out, it's by Lynette Silver, and in it she states that the nurses that were on Raji Beach, the Singapore nurses who were there, uh, that before they were marched into the ocean and shot, they were basically raped and tortured, right? So I thought, well, good history always respects the evidence and tries to deal with the evidence that doesn't fit, right? As Professor Margaret Macmillan said, there's no easy answers in history and you have to respect the evidence. But I sort of turned around and thought, well, could there be a different interpretation of the evidence to that presented by this author in this book. And I'm gonna leave it up to you to decide whether the evidence is enough evidence to say that these women were raped, right? On the beach before being machine gunned. Now this first surfaced in 2019. Well, the first I knew about it was in 2019. And I've just put up here, this is Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? So this is not, all these, these articles I'm showing you tonight are not the full articles, right? I suggest if you want the full articles, they're all online, you can go and read them, right? I've just cherry-picked parts out of it, right? So in 2019, uh, Tim Barlas there, he's written a review of Lynette's book, and he says, uh, Lynette Silver knows a history detective, has pulled together all the evidence and says categorically, that the 22 nurses were raped before they were forced into the same machine gun. Only one survived. Now, that secret they were keeping, so they kept the war crime secret, the secret that they were keeping was the fact that the 21 nurses with Vivian Bullwinkle, the sole survivor on the beach at Raji, were raped. Okay. The reason Vivian Bullwinkle did not come clean, which she intended to before her death, well, she lived quite a long time, was because she ordered she was ordered when she was still in the army not to include these details in her depositions at the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunals, which took place in December 1946. And then she adds here, the only reference to violation was taken out of the archives and destroyed, destroyed before it ever went to trial, Silver said. Well, if it's not in the file, how do you know it's been taken out and destroyed? I don't know. That's a, that's a funny quote to put in there because if it's not there and there's no note saying these files have been destroyed, that's a big one, isn't it? Then we came to this. Bullwinkle said she would speak out, but she took her secret to the grave. Well, almost, says Tim. She had spoken confidentially to broadcaster Tess Lawrence in an, on, in an online 2017 article 
She wrote, Bullwinkle was tortured by the secret. She confirmed that she, had, she and other women gunned down had been violated beforehand by the Japanese soldiers. Now, Vivian died in 2000, so 17 years later, Tess Lawrence is saying she spoke to Vivian, okay? Okay, but it's taken 17 years to come out. The second matter, the second matter related to the violation was more, it irked her even more, wrote Lawrence. She had been ordered by the government not to say anything about rape. She had wanted to put this in a statement for the War Crimes Tribunal, but was ordered not to by the Australian government. Well, why would the Australian government? Uh, Silver said if she decided not to write this book, she could be added to the long, long, long line of people covering up the story. Well, who were the long line of people? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, then 10 days later, this gets picked up again by another publication. This is Gary Nunn this time. Uh, so the massacre, truth too awful to speak. Well, at least Gary's put here, and the Australian authorities allegedly, allegedly hushed it up. Now, what took my eye, now we've, we've, we've seen what Harold's up to, we all know about Harold Williams from what I've explained before. Miss Silver discovered a part of a page missing detailing what had happened to the nurses and a key account that had been ripped out, ripped out, in what she believes an act of censorship, right? The account was by Jean Williams, which is the wife of Harold Stannett Williams, here he is there, about investigation he conducted in the Australian war crime section. Raising more questions than answers, this 10-page report, well, let me tell you, it's a biography, right? It's not a report, it's a biography, and I'll get to that in a minute. In the National Library of Canberra, written by Jean Williams' wife, uh, wife of Major Harold Williams, about investigations, well, no, it's not, it's about his life, right? It's a biography about his life. Uh, he conducted for the Australian War Crime Section. Her account includes his investigation of murders of nurses, examining it, Silver discovered that nurses' narrative has stopped mid-sentence. Ooh, there's something. Writing in Angel of Mercy, Silver stated that there was nothing more on the next page. Mrs. Williams' narrative had continued over leaf, but someone had crudely hacked off five centimetres with a pair of scissors. It was evident that whatever Mrs. Williams had written about the nurses had been removed by someone. Well, as long as it had been written about the nurses, right? Determined that no one else should see it. Okay, right. Well, when I read that, I thought, well, what's Harold being mixed up in? You know, like what, what could possibly, what would Jean have cut off the, what would, uh, what would uh, Jean have cut off the, uh, the bits for? Well, Williams had been part of the Director of Prisoner of War Internees. He'd have been pointed to the first world, uh, the first Australian war crimes at the end of the war. Uh, he'd been in, as I'd mentioned, he's been involved with the uh, internee exchange, he's, uh, which went under the 30-year non-disclosure rule. He was also involved with the Cower breakout. Now, what happened with the Cower breakout was uh, DPI, DPWI was very frightened that uh, uh, word was going to get back to the Japanese that farmers had been shooting Japanese prisoners to escape from Cower. And so Harold had to go down and speak to the witnesses before they took the stand down there. So, <laughs> but anyway, to continue with the book. However, it was evident whatever else Mrs. Williams had written about the nurses had been removed by someone determined that no one should see it. But is there a better explanation, right? And all I'm looking at here is, I have to tell you, this is my interpretation of the evidence compared to the author's interpretation of the evidence because I went and found it, right? She didn't cite it in the book. She didn't put a citation in the book about where to find it, but I found it. It's in the, and it, there is the citation, so if you want to go and have a look at it for yourself, you can call up box 79 at the National Archive from the Williams Collection, and here it is. So what is it, here is the missing section, right? This is the section she's talking about, which has been ripped out, and it's obviously about the nurses and what have you. But let's just have a quick, closer look at what Jean Williams wrote. And we'll look at it here. So this is where she starts. The Australian's nurses, this is Jean Williams' work, this is the 10-page report, which is actually a biography of Harold. Australian nurses escaped from a bomb ship in a lifeboat, which eventually drifted towards the island. Shocked and suffering privation, they must have welcomed the sight of land. Yeah, I bet they did. When their boat came closer, 
a small number of Japanese burst from the undergrowth near the shore and opened fire on the nurses. Well, that's not what Vivian said. Thinking all were dead, they merged again into the jungle. A short time later, a small platoon of Australian soldiers <laughs> searching for the Japanese stragglers found that the lifeboat and beside it was the body of another nurse. All in the boat were dead, but the nurse in the water was alive. She was cared for and returned to Australia. She was sister Vivian Bullwinkle, later matron Bullwinkle. But that's not what happened, right? Vivian was there, that is not what happened, but that's what, Jean, that's what Jean believes happened, right? But the author hasn't put that in a book because that doesn't fit the narrative, right? So looking at this, Jean doesn't even really know what the story is. Okay, but the point is, she says here that the narrative stops, right? So she says, he, he had the Australian records of the island. So she's talking about Harold here, right? The place, the date, it, and it finishes at it, right? But if we go to the next page, the one that's had the piece ripped off it about the nurses, here it is here. Now, what Jean's done at this stage is she's gone, oh, hang on a second, these two lines here have nothing to do with the nurses, right? They're the next story down here. So she's drawing this arrow, saying, oh, they should be down here. And she's added two page numbers here, page eight. So this is the end of page eight, which is the previous page, and this is the start of page nine. Now, if you remember the last sentence that, that she says, where, where it stops mid-sentence, it stops with it. If you look here, it starts with it. It should have been an easy case to solve. Now, you tell me, right? You can make your own summation about this. Has Jean just made a mistake and started typing the, the next story before finishing this one? Or has this been censored in some degree? You have to make your own summation on that. Just to go one step further with these documents, because it took me so long to find them. Here, they, here are the three, three pages that ran after that. So she's repaginated them all. Nine, 10, and this would have been 11. And you can see this story is not a report, it's actually his life story, you see. Three times after he resumed, resumed civilian life. So it's not a report on war crimes, it's his biography. Now, when I was looking for this, looking for reports by Major Harold William on the nurses, there actually is a whole file down in Melbourne about it, okay? And here it is, you know, Major Harold Williams, period of that, da 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 da. I went to have it digitised, but they wanted $280 for it. And I, <laughs> for tonight's lecture, I think I might as well go down and have a look at it myself. But I can assure you, it probably has nothing in it about the nurses being raped, because otherwise it would have been in the book. Now, something else is, in box 69 that I first went to, when I started looking for these documents, I found that Jean had actually written this story twice, right? So she'd written it twice wrongly. So if she was going to write about him being raped on the second story, why didn't she write, write about him in the first story? Because she didn't know. She didn't even know what the story was, basically. So as, as evidence of them being raped, I don't, I don't know. You can make your own summation, but I don't think it holds a lot of water. Then at the end of last year, um, Ellen Fanning wrote this article. Now, I like Ellen Fanning. I actually think she's quite a good journalist, but I just don't know quite where, she, where she's coming from with this. But anyway, she wrote that, you know, there was a, in the memorial there's a brief sanitised description. Well, it's actually quite substantial. Uh, website. I was going to go to it tonight, but we won't because I think you all know the story. Um, they shot and bayoneted the males, which they did. They separated the males from the females. They took them around the headland and they shot them. Okay. Uh, she wrote here, the official account of what happened to Sister Bullwinkle on the beach and in years afterwards in the Japanese prison of war camp, a story, a story well known to generations a year after the war, has always hinted at darker horrors. Now, She's right. I learned about the, the nurses in 1975 doing history in fifth form. That's year 11 to you younger people. Um, we, we studied three things. We studied the fall of Singapore, the Kokoda Trail, and the nurses being shot. 
But Ellen writes here, yet for decades the unpalatable truth of what she suffered was censored mainly by military men, I don't know, go figure, uh, concerned about women's reputation about the personal national shame. Vivian Bullwinkle had tried to get the truth out but had been censored. A war crime had been censored. But on what evidence? Okay. Noted historian that's still working alongside Miss Banks, which is Georgina Banks. She wrote a book about her aunt, who was one of the nurses on the beach, to, uh, to search for evidence, further evidence about what really happened. Miss Silver has uncovered a key witness to whom Vivian Bullwinkle disclosed the rapes. Retired Army Major Patricia Hinks, okay, told a brief 1991 meeting with Sister Bullwinkle in Fremantle. Uh, she said that uh, Vivian was having a dispute with her publisher because she did not want to publish the, the whole truth about the massacre on the basis of upset relatives, murders, murder nurses, murder nurses, she says. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if I was writing the book and the publisher said I was going to put it in, I know what I'd say, well, you're not getting my book, or, or my editor, I'd be saying you're not getting my book, but anyway. The now retired Major Hinks asked Bo Sister Bullwinkle, well, what is the truth? Sister Bullwinkle, Bullwinkle replied, we were actually tortured and raped, and then we were marched into the sea. Okay. Well, there she is, she's saying it, but this is 32 years, this is coming out 32 years after Vivian's death, right? Um, so, the, so the article goes on, and this gets a bit interesting, because they're talking about Vivian's medical history now, right? So a four-page medical history was dictated to Allied doctors by Sister Bullwinkle herself, relying on detailed diaries she kept in captivity. Now, I can tell you, as I said, I've transcribed the seven diaries of Stuart Nottage, Betty Jeffrey's diary, and um, Jean McLaren's diary for the War Memorial. And I can tell you, in the War Memorial, there is one diary of Vivian Bullwinkle's, and you can see it online, it's digitised, but it's mainly full of recipes, right? For two reasons, I mean, Vivian had been shot, so the, when she got back to the camp, the other nurses were looking after her, right? They knew she'd been shot, but they also were going to keep it very, very quiet because they were frightened if the Japanese found out that Vivian had survived a massacre, she may, yeah, she may just disappear one night. So they kept it very, they were very frightened about it, right? But I've never come across and never heard of Vivian keeping detailed diaries, so I'd love to see them. I'd really love to see them. If they're, if they're available, if anybody can tell me where they are, I'd love to see them. But according to this, on the May the 2nd, 1942, and the 1942 I've gotten read there because it's important, 10 weeks after the massacre on the beach, Sister, Sister Bullwinkle developed what was described as furnuncles or boils on her thighs, and what she thought was a fungal infection or tinea on her feet, right? Because they're nurses, they know what tinea is, and they've, you know, they've, they've been up in the tropics. And... But then they go here. Her symptoms had become so bad, she was hospitalised for 25 days. Upon discharge, her feet uh, were only slightly improved. Dr Lewis, a professor of sexual health at the University of Sydney, hello David, uh, had written a, day, a detailed review of Vivian's medical file. Asked whether she could have been suffering from a sexually transmitted disease widespread amongst the Japanese troops in the Pacific, Professor Lew Lewis cautions, right, that a definitive diagnosis would require a blood test, right, but adds syphilis is known as a great uh, imitator, a bacterial infection that can mimic any other common conditions. Well, one thing about a blood test, I can tell you, when the rebel nurses came back from Japan, when they hit Australia, the first thing the army nurses would do was they were rushed off the Concord Hospital. And they were kept there for a series of weeks and they had a series of tests. All the tests you can ever think of. In fact, Lorna was saying that they were dewormed and they were this and that and the other. Well, the same thing would have happened to these girls. They would have been straight off the Concord Hospital, right? While Dr Lewis writes, right, Professor Lewis, I should say, I beg your pardon, writes that the most likely cause of the feet lesions might have well been tinea, right? The timing fits for syphilis, right? Well, it is as long as that's 2nd of May 1942, right? It, it does fit, right? Okay. Then he goes on. Um, and we'll just skip that. But the, given the comment uh, that Bullwink has subsequently revealed that she'd been raped by the Japanese soldiers, this could provide an opportunity for transmission of causative bacterium. And we know that syphilis is a highly infectious condition. 
Five months after the rate in mid-July 1942, Sister Bungle was hospitalised again for nine days. While, this, while the brief clinical notes indicate she was being treated for her feet, is it possible that she miscarried, right? A child during the hospital stay. Well, there's something, isn't it? Where did that evidence come from? Well, I have to tell you, when I read this, I sort of thought, well, it's all very... We don't know where the diaries are. We're saying this is in May 1942, which matches beautifully for the 10 weeks for the incubation of syphilis. It's all very good. So I thought I'd go back to a primary source, which is this book, right? Wild History Pass, that's the book. And this is written, this book's written by Jesse Simmons. There it is, that's the book. Now, if you look here, this is page 61. And Jessie's already into early January 1943. So she's dating us for us. She's saying this is what happened in 43. What, what I thought was interesting here, um, it was early January 1943 that we were electrified by the arrival of a Japanese official who flew in from Singapore, especially to see us Australian Army nursing service girls. He spoke English and told us that Mr Curtin through neutral channels had been inquiring and concerning about our welfare. The Australian government sent the message, keep smiling. Now, why would the Japanese send somebody in 1943? Well, I'll tell you why, what I think anyway. In January 1943, the Japanese had come back to the, the British and said, look, that last exchange went so well, right? We want to have another one. And this time around, what we'd like is our pearl divers back from Australia, right? Now, the reason they wanted the pearl divers back was because they could repair the ships, right? Because they were divers, right? Anyway, MacArthur put his foot on that and said, look, the last one was such a disaster, you're not doing it again. Okay, <laughs> basically. But that's getting off, the, off track here. So Jessie's dating this in 1943 for us, right? So on page 62, she's into February 1943. Halfway down this page, she starts talking about the hospitals. And finally this one. Sickness finally became so prevalent that only the worst cases could be admitted to hospital. And even for them, only barest minimum treatment was possible because they didn't have any medical supplies or anything else. Chronic bronchitis, dysentery and dengue fever were common complaints. And tinea, a skin disease, was widespread, right? Vivian Bullwinkle, well hello, had a spell in hospital with tinea and was discharged with gravely, uh, discharged, and when discharged was gravely advised that butter or margarine rubbed onto the affected parts would be beneficial. This struck us as all a good joke since we hadn't seen either since we'd left Singapore. But the point is, right, the point of this is, here we are in 1943, here's somebody on the ground there saying that Vivian was put in hospital in 43. If, if we go back to the previous slide, they're saying it's in 1942. It's July 42, apparently. <laughs> so, so I don't know, maybe, maybe she went in in 42, maybe she went in 43. Without these diaries, we will never tell, will we? We can never tell. But the thing is that Jessie was on the ground. She was there at the time and she wrote it in her book, okay? Now, to support the story in the, in the paper, they had this, this one page of this document that was Vivian Bullwinkle's, but it stops in February 1942. Now, if you've got a document saying, why, well, you know, she had tinea and she had this and she had that or the other, why aren't you putting that in as evidence? I don't know. Anyway, maybe that's the only one they could find. But the book continues. So we're now looking for evidence besides Harold Williams and, and uh, the, the tinea problem or the sexually transmitted disease problem, whichever way you want to believe it. We're looking for further evidence in the book. Now, the author leads here. In 1992 statement by Yoshimi Yoshishaki here, he floated the idea the possibility that the nurses were forced to be comfortable with women, which the also, author also notes that the women at the time totally denied, right? They said, no, it didn't happen, right? So he's floating the idea and they're saying, no, it didn't happen, right? So the next bit of evidence that she comes up with is Charlie Johnston's diary. Now, she writes in the book that she had a copy of Charlie Johnson's diary before it was published, right? That Charlie had given it to her, is probably in a laser printed form or whatever. 
and it contained this statement here. The 1st of October, this is post-war, so Charlie's been liberated. 1st of October, we anchored in the roads of Singapore. Matron and two officers went ashore. Uh, we saw them come aboard a few hours later with Matron weeping. One of the colonels told us, one of the colonels told us, this is important, they had gone ashore to see a number of Australian nurses recovered from POW camps up country. They were in a shocking state, physically and mentally. Mentally, all had VD, a sexually transmitted disease, and some of them had children. Now, Charlie's on a ship in Singapore, having been a prisoner of war for three years, over three years, and there it is. It's in his laser printed diary. So the author wrote, my reaction reading this such definitive statement, right, in Charlie's diary was one of shock, right? Could there be any truth in it, or was it complete fiction? However, the latter seemed unlikely as it was hardly something Charlie could invent, would invent. And I, would not, and I had not come across any other inaccuracies in the rest of his diary, which at, that, at times is very detailed. So she's saying Charlie's diary's totally accurate, right? Now what she does say, and I haven't put in this, that was when Charlie's diary was published in, in a book form, this statement wasn't in it, right? And she puts that down to being edited out, being censored out, right? So, I don't know. Who knows? But what we'll do, what, what the problem with Charlie's diary is, he's saying, okay, on the 1st of October they went ashore. So again, going back to basics, oops, sorry, I've gone one too far. Going back to basics, I thought, well, what does is, what is Betty Jeffrey write about this? This is Bet Betty's book here, White Coolies, right? Well, what Betty says is on the 1st of October 1945, we were taken to a new POW reception centre, right? At Changi today and saw and met Gracie Fields, a British singer. She was giving a concert. She was wonderful and had us in fits of laughter. We loved listening to her pianist too. We hadn't heard a pianist for very long. The 3rd of October, we had a party, right? And on the 4th of October, we're going home. Whoopee, right? They were in very high spirits, obviously, from what... Betty's written here, but of course what Charlie said, well, they were in a shocking state physically and mentally. Well, there's a photograph of them. You tell me. Where are the children? <laughs> right. So further on, the author continues. And at this point, Yoshi's floating the possibility, possibility that the women were forced to be comfort women becomes a revelation, right? Now, as a revelation, right, it's being presented as a fact. But there's no evidence for being a fact. Now, she says that Yoshi wrote this book. So I bought the book. There's the book, right? But there's nothing in this book about the Singapore nurses. So, so, so whether she means the revelation is in the book or whether, I don't know, has just suddenly gone from floating the idea, the possibility that they were raped, to being an actual fact. So... I don't know. I don't know how that came about. Now, apart from the denials of the surviving nurses issued in 1992-93, following Yoshi, Yoshishima's revelations, the only reference to sexual interference by the Japanese was in the form of an official denial, right? <laughs> 50 years before. It was contained in a signal sent in September 1945 by the commander of the second reception group in Singapore to the Adjutant General in Canberra. For peace, and this is the cable, for peace of mind of the relatives, 24 sisters recovered and now in the second 24th Australian General Hospital, all well cared for and happy and making good progress, none molested by Japanese. This information supplied by the matron in chief, Annie Sage, who returned with them to Sumatra and assures us of this fact, recommend that relatives be informed. Now, Annie Sage actually flew to where they were, were in the camp and picked them up and brought them back to Singapore. So she was the officer in charge of the Australian Army Nursing Service at that stage. So that's a pretty definitive statement, right? Now, the author put in here, I had always assumed that this very definitive statement, referring to molestation, had been included in the message to ally fears that the nurses had been subjected to this kind of treatment, which occurred in other areas and had been reported in the press. Well, when I went looking for it to being reported in the press, the only one I could find um, was this one here, right? And it's, it's, this is in, in the Dutch, who were used as comfort women, but this again has been written in London. 
So he's working off whatever information he's got here. Now the other, the other nurses who definitely were raped were the ones in Hong Kong. When the, when the Japanese invaded Hong Kong, they, they took the hospital there and they certainly did molest the British nurses in the, ho in the hospital in Hong Kong. There's no doubt about that, it did happen. So you can't deny that, that there's evidence for that and it certainly happened. But there were survivors of it who reported it as having happened, right? They didn't, they didn't worry about the... the you know. <laughs> so, so there's something funny. They, they were willing to talk about it, but we supposedly suppressed this one. Well, the author then poses the question. Until Johnson's diary surfaced, the motive for stating that the Sumatra nurses had not been molested seemed to cut and dried and put, put the minds of the families and friends at rest. However, was there now the possibility that it had been included to forestall any suggestion that they had been molested? On one hand, there was a second-hand statement attributed to any sage, allegedly stating that the nurses had not been molested. And on the other, on the, on the second hand, on the other second-hand statement attributed to the weeping matron. Well, hang on a second. Charlie didn't attribute it to the weeping matron. He says the colonels told us. So. This is just making a mistake of what she'd already written, right? She's basically either mistakenly, just through confirmation bias, changed that to the weeping matron from when it was actually the colonel. But she said it doesn't matter because this book came out and that book tells you everything. Well, it tells you nothing. Clearly answer the statement of what she, the, the, the question that she posed here. Uh, with the evidence presented, there is no motive for matron sage or the officer of the reception group to state that the women had not been molested to forestall any suggestion that they had, right? But by switching those two around, it makes it seem like there was. So having confused what Johnson actually wrote, the author proposes a series of questions. Is it possible the British nurses liberated from other camps may have brought orphan Eurasian children with them? Well, if you read these books, if you read the actual people who were there, right, they say, although nothing is mentioned about the prisoners being orphaned with a rear Asian child with them, Annette Chan had her own children with her, right, in that camp, right, and that's written by Betty Jeffrey. Um, and Jesse Simmons also noted a number of the Dutch and, and uh, British women, who obviously married women, were having children in the camp, right, <laughs> nine, months nine months after they'd left Singapore. So, yes, yeah, some of them did have children with them, but they weren't the Australian nurses. Um, the author then asks, if the nurses mentioned in Johnson's diary were not Australian, why were senior Australian medical staff visiting them? Well, Charlie doesn't actually say that the colonels were Australian medical staff. He just said there were a couple of colonels. So, and con considering Betty Jeffrey states that they were at a concert on the day, I ask the question, were the officers of matron actually visiting the Australian nurses or were they visiting some of the women in Changi? Or were they going to the concert? Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know. It's all a bit vague, isn't it? Yeah. So we then get to Yuri Tanaka. Now, Tanaka is a, is a professor, I believe, now at Melbourne University. Yuri, Yuri gave a couple of uh, uh, seminars or lectures at ANU that I know of. Um, he said that Evidence suggests Bullwinkle lied to protect the dead colleagues from the disgrace of being raped. However, he cites no evidence to support this statement. That's my, my, my words for it. And I also have his book, Hidden Horrors, which he wrote a bit later on. And in that year, he says, um, he broadens his statement by suggesting that the nurses had not volunteered to be comfort women. And again, puts forward the suggestions that the nurses on Raji, Raji Beach may have, I underline may, have been raped. Right? So is that evidence? I don't think so. Oh, that's, that's speculation. He's speculating that, yeah, maybe they did, maybe Vivian didn't tell the truth. So the next bit of evidence that the author comes up with is Stoker Lloyd. Now, Lloyd had been on the beach with the women when they came ashore. And if you know the story, the Japanese came down and they separated the men and they took them around the headland and basically executed them around the headland while the, while the nurses were still on the beach. Now, Stoker Lloyd was actually a survivor of that execution. So he writes here that he, that he, was, he, he got away into, the, into the, um, the water and he was wounded four times. 
and they believed him to be dead, but he lived in the jungle for three days and then he returned to the beach. So he's returning to the beach three days after the massacre happened, right? Uh, and uh, he says here, uh, I returned to the beach, I found some of the nurses who had been seen alive, uh, who I had last seen alive dead on the beach. They were scattered in terrible attitudes and many had just, many must have been killed as they were tending the wounded men. Well, no, they weren't. They were marching into the ocean, right? So obviously the body's, whatever he's looking at, is sort of in the wrong position. Later I met an American civilian who was, I believe, was Eric, a guy called Eric German who also survived the massacre around the other side of the headland, who said that the women had become restless when, the, when they heard the firing. And when they came over to see, when they came over to see what had happened, that's come over to the headline, headland, I, I assume, the Japanese opened fire and killed 24 of them. I heard that one nurse who was a survivor from this incident was Sister Bullwinkle. I was told that she was later brought to Sumatra as a prisoner of war. Well, that story doesn't ring true either because the nurses didn't go over to the headland to find the officers. They were actually marched into the ocean and shot. So. That's a little bit of ex uh, speculation, I think, on Eric's part. So the other problem is he said they were bayoneted and shot. Well, Vivian never said anything about the nurses being bayoneted, right? So I don't know what he's looking at, but a lot of it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, <laughs> the author then moves on to, as a part of the, her evidence that this happened, of the 15 pages she wrote about this in the section, she writes five pages about betrayal in high places. Now, betrayal in high places has proved to be a work of fiction, right? So you can't use betrayal in high places as evidence of, that the nurses were raped because it just, it's a work of fiction. But she doesn't accept it as being a work of fiction. So, I, we, considering it can be proved as a work of fiction, I don't think you can say, say anything that comes out of it can be used as evidence, right? Another thing was the problem with uniforms. Now, this was looked into by Barbara Angel, and Barbara, Barbara Angel actually looks, runs a very good website about the nurses, and I've never met Barbara, but I, I, I think her heart's in the right place, and she'd been at it for, she's been at it for a long time. But the trouble is, the problem with the, with the uniform is, when they looked, examined the uniform, the entrance hole of the bullet is slightly lower than the exit hole of the bullet in the uniform, right? So the, the bullets, when, the, when the uniform's hanging flat, the trajectory of the bullet is up that way like that. Now, there's a number of reasons why this could have occurred. Now they're saying, well, it was pulled up and around her and whatever. But our friend Ross, Ross Torrington, who knows a little bit about Japanese firearms, says to me, well, look, Rod, you said, most of the Japanese, well, in fact, all the larger Japanese machine guns are fired from the prone position. So they'd have to be lying down. They're not firing from the hip, right? Especially the woodpecker, because it had a tray magazine that went across the top. So logically, they're down a bit, little bit lower as the women are walking in. But the other problem is that, as you know, when you walk into the ocean with your board shorts on, and they fill up with air and they, they raise up. Well, if you're wearing a skirt, and I haven't done it walking into the ocean, but I would sure imagine that the air would get trapped inside it and it'd come up, which would also allow for the fact that the bullet holes weren't quite perfectly aligned. So is that evidence? You, you've got to sort of, you can make up your own mind about that. Um, then the other thing is, she's written in here that uh, a third party uh, was driving uh, Betty Jeffrey and Wilma Oman, Oram, um, somewhere, and uh, Betty said to, to Wilma, you won't tell our story, will you? All right, now this is a third party, this is a hearsay, so it's, it's somebody saying that they heard say this. But <laughs> there's no, without presenting evidence to substantiate there was any secret, this is purely speculation, it's not evidence, right? And the other thing is, I suspect the story of, that Betty was referring to was possibly what her fellow prisoner, Pat Darling, described as Betty's preference for company of women over men. Now, that's covered quite, quite um, well in this book uh, about Betty's life after the war. And I think Colin did quite a sensitive and, and good job on that. Uh, and also, I heard that from uh, Pat Darling. And that's Pat's book there, which I got 
when I went to visit her in 2007. So there she is, she's inscribed it to me in 2007. So Pat told me the same story really about Betty's preferences. So looking at all the evidence, we're getting close to the end. Looking at the evidence presented, Jean Williams documents, well, they contain incorrect narrative, right? The, miss, the, the missing part of the page is easily explained, right? So if you want to call that evidence, well, you can, but it's not evidence to me. Uh, Yoshimia, Yoshima, uh, Yoshisaki's floating the possibility that the nurses were forced to be wound, which was denied by the surviving uh, Australian Army Nursing Service members at the time. Floating a possibility is not evidence, right? <laughs> We, 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 I could float the possibility that they, they travelled by elephant between camps, but, you know, without evidence. Uh, Charles Johnson's diary, well, as we've seen, you know, we don't know who the, who the matron and the officers were, were, uh, were seeing. They had no children with them, and it's not published in his published diary. Yuki, can, Yuki can, Tanaka, well... He, he, can, he stated that, that, you know, that, that Paul Wingle lied to protect her dead colleagues from the disgrace of being raped, but he offers no evidence to support the claim. Stoker Lloyd's bodies on the beach. He wrote, they lay at intervals a few yards in different positions and in various stages of undress. They'd all been shot and bayoneted. Well, Vivian never said anything about them being bayoneted, so I'm not quite sure what he's looking at there. James Mackay's book, well, we've been through that. It's, it's proved as a work of fiction. The uniform problem, easy to explain if you understand the, the machine gunning and the other factors that could be involved. Feeling of a secret being held, well, it's not evidence, okay? So that leaves us with, you can't prove that someone didn't say something. It's not pos possible to prove a negative, right? So we've got the retired uh, Army Major, Patricia Hinks, being told by Vivian that uh, they were tortured and raped, okay, well, We've probably got to accept that. But she only revealed it 32 years after Vivian's death. I don't know why. Tess Lawrence was told by Vivian in 2000. Well, we're not quite sure when she was told. She said that Vivian travelled to Melbourne to meet her. But I have to tell you, I met, uh, I met Vivian in, in 1997. And I'll tell you how it came about. It was the dedication of the Nurses Memorial in Canberra. And Lorna Johnson, one of the Raval nurses, had been flown out from New Zealand by the Department of Veteran Affairs, and the surviving nurses from that time were, were all held, all brought by Veterans Affairs to be part of the, the commemoration of the opening of the Nurses Memorial, which is down from the War Memorial. Here we go, it's a beautiful memorial, it's, it's made in glass, very good thing. It's also got Not Now Tomorrow on it, which is one of the things that the rebel nurses were always told, you know, we want this or not now, you can have it tomorrow. Okay, the other problem is in the 1990s, Vivian had had a terrible stroke and she was basically, um, according to her nephew who I spoke to, he said that she could hardly speak. I'm not quite sure when the 90s this happened, but I have to tell you when I met her in 1997, what happened is after the, after the dedication was over, Lorna said, Rod, we're, the Veteran Affairs are taking us back up to the War Memorial. If you'd like to come and talk to me, I'll be up there. So Albert Spear and I walked up to the memorial, they were bust up, and we got up there and we found Lorna. We, we met Pat, Pat, Pat Darling for the first time because Pat and Lorna were together. And she said, that's Vivian Bullwinkle over there. And Vi poor old Vivian was in a wheelchair with her carer and she was asleep. <laughs> because she'd been very sick. According to, according to her nephew, through the 90s she was very sick. Um, she didn't have a lot of energy, she'd had this terrible stroke, but at the same time she'd flown to Melbourne and she'd talked to Tess Lawrence. Well, make of it what you will. What the author doesn't go into, because if you find evidence that doesn't fit that block of concrete that falls in your path, right, you've got to ignore it, because if it doesn't fit the narrative, right, you've, got to, you've just got to ignore it. Well, when I went looking for what Vivian had actually said, Vivian herself, this, this is in Trove, I looked into Trove, and a correspondence had asked, had asked uh, Vivian Bullwinkle a question, uh, a rather a forward question, I believe, and he, he apologised. The current correspondent began to apologise for asking Sister, Sister Bullwinkle to recall the terrors. No, she said, this story is one that must be told everywhere in case people believe the Japanese are uh, not as black as they are, are painted. 
I only hope that in the future people realise they are not humans. Now you tell me, is that the sort of person who's going to go, oh, they've told me not to speak out so I'm not going to speak out? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, and that's what she said. I didn't say that. That's what she said. Now, the other thing is, Helen Collegian, who I, I was, was Dutch, she ended up in the same camp as the Australian nurses. And she was only young. She was only about 20, I believe. Um, in her book, Song of Survival, which I've got, I didn't bring it along tonight, I don't think, but in, in Song of Survival, she says, right, and this is a quote from her, and she was in the, in the camp, right? In our camp, no one was raped. The Japanese soldiers were strictly forbidden to sexually molest or, or molest the imprisoned women. Such an order was not uniformly followed in all camps, because she's talking about the Dutch camps in 1944, 1945. But if a soldier was caught disobeying the order, he was usually executed for the offence. Now, why would that be? Now, just have a, have, a, have a bit of a think about this. What made these women different from the Dutch women who, in 1944, we know were used, forced to be comfort women, right? I'll tell you what the difference is, because you won't work it out. But if, if the Australians had women had value as pawns in the exchange game, if they were sexually molested, they would have hopped on the ship and come back to Australia and said, they treated us terribly. They... they tortured and raped us and this is... So the Japanese weren't going to do it because at that stage they're still trying to get the exchange happening, right? So they had a value. So that sort of knocks everything else out into a... Into a especially this one, this, this, this statement that if they got caught doing it, they were going to be executed. Yeah, but, but the reality is the soldiers on that island were not part of a formal structure in a prisoner of war camp. They weren't subject to the same rules of discipline that you would normally find in those circumstances. But there were soldiers actually out in the field. So that, I don't think you can draw that comparison to the island with any degree of uh, legitimacy. So you're, you're arguing with somebody who was there? No, I'm not. No, I, I, I understood that you were drawing from the statement in relation to those soldiers there in the POW camp that they don't conduct themselves in that way. Therefore, they would not have conducted, you know, that same situation holds on the island. Uh, yeah, I, I understand. But so you're saying in the situation on the beach, yes. where, they're, where they're outside the command structure of the camp? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll accept that. Yeah. Yeah. But I still don't think it happened. <laughs> because even they, they've still got an officer over the the, 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 the... the Japanese on the beach still have an officer over the top of them. And we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute too. I, I understand your point. I... I I, I accept your reasoning, yeah. Now, the other thing that happens, right, so before 1946, before Vivian goes back to the cha Japan, where she supposedly had been told by the Australian government that she wasn't allowed to talk about what had happened, in, in October 1945, so this is very close after the end of the war, because the war ended in August, as you know, with the dropping of the atomic bomb, um, Vivian came back and made a statement to the Web Commission, right? And she just told them what had happened. Uh, well, they came back from around the headland where they'd executed the officers. Uh, they came back, sat in front of us, and uh, when they'd finished cleaning their rifles and bayonets, they stood up, and the one in charge suggested we should go towards the sea. So there was an officer in charge, and we'll get to him in a minute. And he sent a couple of Japs to push us along, probably at the point of a bayonet, we went towards the sea and kept walking in. And when we got to our, up to our waist, they started firing up and down the line with the machine gun. And the rest of the statements here, but that's the, that's the part that I think is pertinent, right? Now, you were talking about the officer in command. This is him. He's a major, right? They find him. They track him down. Second war crimes track him down. And in 1947, it's our old friend... Harold Williams again, because he's part of DPWI, <laughs> which is what, what uh, Jean was writing about, right? Um, so in 1947, we tried to find uh, Masura, uh, Masa, Masaura, oh, I don't know how, anyway, how you pronounce his name. Uh, 
and we found him that he was a prisoner of the Russians, of all things, right? And we asked for him back, and the Russians just said, oh, no, we can't find him, or whatever the case may be. But they finally did get him back, right? Um, they got him back, okay, but before they could press the matter further, he uh, actually committed suicide in Sagamo prison. So, unfortunately, we couldn't talk to him either. And that comes from uh, a paper by Dr. Narelle Morris, and she's done a lot of work into POWs, and if you want to look it up, there's the, the link for it. She does quite good work, I think, Narelle Morris. Anyway, while I was researching my book, right, uh, my latest book, which is about broadcasting from Japan, I came across Dr. Short here. And Dr. Short had been around during the Second World War. He'd obviously been listening to the German propaganda and what have you. And I think the funny thing is with this, he said, the secret of propaganda is telling people something they are prepared to accept which is to say you are looking for a general modification of attitudes rather than a, a vault face. Well, when it comes to the treachery and the executions carried out by the Japanese at the beginning of the war, is it easy to believe that the Japanese would have tortured and raped the women before they marched them into the ocean and shot? Is it something easy to believe? I think it is, yeah, I think it is. Because the same thing happened to me, and it was confirmation bias again. When I first found out that the Rabao nurses had been put up a, in a hotel when they were taken to Japan, the first thing that came to my mind is they were going to be used as comfort women. And we thought that. Bert, I, Bert Spear and I just sat there and go, ah, oh, they've been put up in a hotel when I was, when I was going to happen next. But we didn't know. And it wasn't. They were put up in a hotel because they were going to be well looked after, so they were going to go on the exchange ship and come back and say how well they'd been looked after. So the thing is, if you're telling the same story again and again from a variety of means of media, and this is before the days of the internet, you've got to understand, so that it's very much a question of coming at them from the same thing with a very conceivable angle, but in such a way that they do not feel that threatened or propagandised, right? Well, if you look at all that evidence, well, supposed evidence, I'd call it myself, I don't think any of it, it's all so circumstantial that I don't think any of it could really stick. If you were going to convict somebody of murder on that evidence, I don't think you could get a conviction, in my opinion, right? So in the case of this, programs are all that, that, that then created, because it is looking at the programs that you see from the sort of breadth of the attack, that they are what they then amount to, right? Correct, the, the opinions are being detrimental to the desired effect. So in other words, what he's saying is, if you keep telling the story the same way and keep it going, and it'll, it'll sink in, right? Which is funny because, this is, this is only the second last slide, but at the end of last year, in November, right, Juliet Hughes here, who must be a reviewer for the Herald or what have you, was reviewing a book of fiction. Now it's a fiction book, she says it's fiction, Sisters Under the Rising Sun by Heaven Morris. But then she writes, this truth, so she's talking about the truth of what happened on Raji Beach. This truth was that Bullwinkle and 21 women who were murdered beside her that day were raped beforehand. Morris's book surprisingly admits this well-known fact. Well-known fact. Which is covered by the journalist Tess Lawrence in 2017 and researched by the historian Lynette Silver in a book, 2019 book, Angels of Mercy which was reviewed by Tim Barless, which is that very first article that we looked at. <laughs> Morris mentions nothing about the rapes on the beach, concentrating instead on, you know, yada da yada yada da. So all of a sudden, from that extremely circumstantial evidence, it's become a well-known fact. Is there a problem here? And look, this is the last slide of the night, and I'll leave this up to Annie Sage. And I think if, uh, if anybody, um, if any of the relatives of any of the women uh, who are on the beach on that day actually watch this video at some stage, I think you can be reassured that um, it didn't actually happen, right? And I think what Annie's written here is probably the most poignant. They ask for neither sympathy or charity. How fortunate are we as Australians, that our women were represented abroad by such grand people. Let us then in gratitude and pride ever remember them and be especially grateful to J. 
Jesse Simmons for giving us this story. Gratitude and pride. That's how we should remember them. Not as liars who never revealed what actually happened, you know? Gratitude and pride. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry it took so long. <laughs> Questions? My question is, was it a Type 96 or a Type 99 machine gun? Could have been either. Both, both fired from the prone position. <laughs> <laughs> According to Roscoe. Roscoe, and Roscoe would know. Yeah. So you really got to make your own summation. That's really what it's about. And I think in anything in history, you know, it's a, it's a perception, and you've got to you've got to be able to say. And look, look, that's the author's interpretation of the evidence. That's how she's interpreted the evidence, right? But I'm interpreting it slightly differently. So you can either believe my interpretation of the evidence or you can believe her interpretation of the evidence. But what I don't think it is, is I don't think it's established as a fact. But now everything is saying it's a fact. It happened. If you go to some of the RSL websites, they've got it up there, you know. But I think because of the articles and the way the articles are biased, really, without checking the evidence, it's a bit like watching Media Watch, you know. If, if, if Media Watch was to pick up on what the evidence actually is, I think they'd have a field day. <laughs> so what did, what did the author of the book that you proved was the total book of fiction say when his book was proved to be a book of fiction? James Mackay, he was Mackay. dead. Oh, was he? Okay. What happened with James Mackay? I'll tell you the story of James if you like, if you've got time. My friend James Oglethorpe, who gave us a couple of lectures about the um, uh, the gliders and uh, third squadron and what have you. Well, that's how I actually met James, because we both knew Albert Speer, and Albert had befriended James Mackay at this stage, you see. And what happened was, James got on. James had worked for Qantas, and he'd worked in Japan for many years, and he knew Sado Island. And part of the book was talking about Sado Island, how Australian prisoners had been down a mine in Sado Island, and the mine had been filled in on top of them, right? And James knew Sado Island, and he, he'd been to Sado Island, and he said, oh, I can't remember ever seeing anything about Australian prisoners being on Sado Island. So he's got a friend in, in Japan called Greg Hadley, and Greg is um, he's a professor at the University of uh, Tokyo over there. He's, a, he's an English professor. And uh, Greg went over to Sado Island to research it, to see what had happened. And none of the local, all the old locals said, no, there was never any prisoners on Sado Island. And they, they, there was also cigarette counts and things like this for the, where they, they actually counted the number of cigarettes that were going to prison. Well, there was no cigarette counts for Sado Island, as I remember it. That may not be the complete story, but they sort of proved that there'd been no prisoners on Sado Island, even though it had been in Mackay's book. And then they turned around and they said, well, look, some of the documents that are presented as the book as being fact don't exist. In fact, the serial numbers don't exist because James had typed them up on his brother electric. The, the, the documents that they saw had been typed up on an electric typewriter, which didn't exist in 1945 because he'd typed them up himself. So he was, he was typing up the documents to fit the history. And there was another book written called Snaring the Other Tiger, and it had used work out, it had used evidence from betrayal in high places. And it was proved to be wrong because he'd used the evidence from a trail in high places as saying, well, this is what happened here because it's in betrayal in high places. And to be quite honest with you, one of the other problems is one of the, one of the reasons why this author might be so intent on proving that betrayal in high places is right is because she's used information out of it in another book, which is wrong. The information she used is fictitious, it's just not, it's just not a fact. And has that been pointed out to her? Yes. <laughs>